I'm here with chinchilla rancher Kion Wolf. Howdy. We're standing here in a public park where you graze your chinchillas. How many of them are out here? Maybe 400, 10, 6,000. I don't really know. Counting the beasts is the Lord's work. Get down, get off me back, dang it. What was that one doing? Well, I can't rightly say. It may have been mounting me for vile purposes, or it may have been fixing to attack my veins and get my blood. They do that? If you hear them clicking or hissing, you best back away. Do you understand? Look me in the eye, son. I know your people have trouble with eye contact. My people? You know who I mean. Now, the word chinchilla means little chincha. What is a chincha? I couldn't tell you, son, but they were brought up here from Peru by hard-working Spanish people. They kept their families intact. Not like your people. Watch out, that one is fixing to spring. They're going to go right for where the blood is near the surface if you catch my drift. Maybe we could focus on the problem you're having with the government. Yeah, they say I can't graze my beasts here in the park. They've stripped away all the grass. Son, they do that so they can bathe. A chinchilla takes a dust bath. They roll in the pumice, which is part of the Lord's plan. Do they have names? They sure do. That one is lapel. Over there is sleeve, cuff, and collar. Those are parts of coats. So are they, son. Is there anything you'd like to say to the government right now? Yes, as a matter of fact, there is. This goes back to my mother's mother, my father's father, my mother's father's mother and father. They all worked this land. We've been grazing chinchillas in this park for a long time, and suddenly we're under attack by the same people covering up the truth that Wolf Blitzer is a Chinese spy, Mary Richards was the real person, and Mary Tyler Moore is the character. There's a plot to have the whole world be Canadian by 2025. There's pine tar and Wheaties, the whole nine yards. But don't believe me, son. Listen to what these here radio people have to say. They're on this something or other thing called the nose. And now, back from a week of cockfighting, he knocked out seven out of ten roosters. Colin McEnroe, get back, get back, I will tase you. I was not involved in the cockfighting that has now become a, an issue in Mitch, Mitch McConnell's uh, primary. Uh, and we're not going to talk about that on the nose either. We have other things to talk about. We're not talking about cockfighting. Uh, so if you're turned off by cockfighting shows, absolutely, you can stay with us. So it's time to do the nose, and it is uh, our special Nutty Professor edition of the nose. And in honor of that, uh, Nutty Professor uh, Irene Papoulis from Trinity College joins us. Uh, professor of guitar. Uh, nutty Professor. Of guitar. Nutty Professor of guitar. <laughs> Jim Chapelain is with us. And uh, the man who, if the Nutty Professor will ever be shown at Trinity Cine Studio again, uh, he will have to say, we. Oui. Uh, which all Jerry Lewis fans do say. James Hanley is here with us from Trinity Cine Studio. So that's who the nose is today. A little bit later, uh, you just did hear, I, I hope you heard somewhere in the intro a reference to Cliven Bundy, who uh, went from folk hero to problem in a matter of about 48 hours uh, this week out in Nevada. So we'll come back to him in just a second. And we'll also talk uh, about the latest iteration of Connecticut's tourism campaign, the still revolutionary campaign just turned into revolutionary thoughts. But before we do that, we are going to talk about it. It's sort of an odd week in Connecticut uh, academia where first a professor at Eastern Connecticut State University uh, incurred the wrath of of Republicans in the legislature and, to a certain degree, uh, his own pre university president. And then a University of Connecticut professor of anthropology uh, got into um, a brouhaha, a Donnybrook uh, almost, with, uh, with a creationist who was visiting the campus as a kind of open-air preacher. Uh, that got uh, caught on YouTube. It's uh, – uh, it's at the moment, not exactly viral. There are about 18,000 people who viewed it, but he's really um, – it, it really is an odd situation where the academic seems to be a little bit out of control and, and the creationist not so much. We'll come to him in just a second, but let's begin with the story of Brent Terry. He uh, is an adjunct professor of creative writing at Eastern Connecticut State University. He was captured uh, on audio. Apparently one of his – uh, students was uh, running an audio recorder in class while he was uh, the, it's the audio begins in mid sentence and Terry is referring to somebody as racist misogynist money grubbing people uh, he then talks about how if the Republican Party takes over the Senate in 2014 colleges will start closing uh, up if these people have their way he also talks about these people not wanting uh, black people to vote don't want Latinos to vote don't want old people to vote or young people to vote. Uh, because generally people like you are liberal, he tells his class. So this all gets uh, posted up on a site called Campus Reform, uh, which I sort of gather is a somewhat conservative uh, college campus kind of omnibus website. Um, and, uh, you know, a small disturbance ensues. 
So, but it sort of raises some interesting questions about, you know, what, I mean, we talk about academic freedom, but what can or can't you say to your students in your class? So we do have a professor here. So we will start with you, Arlene Pavulis. How, how did this story strike you? Um, I had some mixed reactions to it. First of all, um, I wonder how a student can, you know, you know, the thought of a student taping, um, secretly taping what I say in class is kind of a scary thought, you know, because I say a lot of things, I, you know, I probably say some things that maybe I wouldn't want, you know, the whole world to be talking about on the nose, you know, and so, and also how does that work? You know, I always, I, I was thinking like whenever I try to tape anything with my phone or film anything with my phone, it, you know, it's over before I can like figure out where the, where the right app is to record it, you know, so the fact that this guy was you know, got the got this amount of tape makes me think. What, what was he recording the whole sh- the whole class? You know, just just waiting for some you know inflammatory remark to come out so that he could do it, or you know, did he just want to record it for his notes so he could study them later? Probably not. You know, and um, so that and when I looked at that website, it looks like that whole website is devoted. I can't remember what it's called. Campus Campus Reform. Campus Reform. You know, it's devoted to saying that you know our professors are ruining our children because they're brainwashing them. Um, so there's all that, like just the idea of taping a class, but also the things that the professor said, and apparently they were talking about a poem about social justice in their creative writing class, seemed um, to be pretty true to me, you know? I mean... And is the truth an adequate defense? <laughs> uh, well, yeah, what's, what's the accusation? You're not supposed to say things like that, you know, they, because they sound, they sound anti-Republican? The thing um, is, the thing is, though, that I'd say get used to arguing. I mean, that's what academia is about. That's what, as a student with a, with a professor, you're really dealing with ideas and you're arguing about ideas. And certainly, if there's a provocation in the class where somebody makes a statement that you you know that upsets you or you don't agree with, then have an argument about it. This idea that there should be some sort of orth- orthodoxy about ideas when you're in a class. I mean, if it's an ad hominem attack or it's some sort of, you know, personal thing, that's obviously out of place. But when you're talking about uh, linking what it sounded to me like was linking ideas from literature to uh, the actual realities. And when you consider that some of the people who are criticizing this are people who are involved in a 24-7 industry of denigrating every possible socially responsible statement that other people make, I, I and think keeping that, the truth away, and keeping, keeping the, yes, keeping and, the, and obfuscating to such a degree that truth is uh, truth appears not to be in existence anywhere that you can't trust anything, and so I think uh, I mean I, I I think that there needs to be more of this. I think that there needs to be more of that sort of sense that you can have an argument in class. I, I certainly at the time I went to uh, classes in the late sixties, early seventies. Part of the thing was that there were a lot of people who really felt the United States was doing the right thing in Vietnam. And there were a lot of people who thought this was completely, absolutely wrong. And so there were big fights in class. That, 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 they, those were important. It was a good thing those were happening. And we don't have enough of that now in an academic atmosphere where people feel that they can argue about these things. I, I want to just, first of all, give out the phone number in case anybody wants to chime in with this. 860-275-7266. 860-275-7266. Then I want to hear what Jim Chapterlain thinks about this. And then I have some ideas that I think are a little bit different from at least uh, uh, the first two of you. I would be curious about the context in yes. which it was delivered. I mean, was it part of a – did he just randomly go on a rant? Uh, was it connected to the material he was talking about? Was this student sort of just, like Irene said, s- recording this for, for further study later, like instead of taking notes? Or was the student sort of laying in wait for them? And then this becomes red meat for people uh, – uh, to say that they're polluting the minds of our youth. But I, I have no argument with what he said. I'm just not – I think if the student was really courageous and had a bone to pick, he would have stood up and, and like James said, argued with him I just and all, defended I, his, his, his point of view. I, I, I wanted to sort of say two things. One of them is I, I wonder how this conversation would be going if this was a creative writing professor, which is what this guy was. And what he was saying was that – he was caught on tape saying that President Obama has no legitimacy as a president, that he's trying to impose socialism a, yeah. on America right now and make us weak and have the government take over everything until we're absolutely ca- incapable of per- personal initiative. I wonder if he'd be def- being attacked by the same people and defended by the same people as are attacking him and defending him now. I, I tend to doubt that. The other thing that I would say is I, 
you know, I don't teach anywhere near as much as, as Irene does. I do occasionally teach, and one of the courses I teach over the last three different presidential uh, election cycles, I've taught a class on mass media in that presidential election. So we teach the course in real time. It's a seminar. Invariably, Trinity, I do it at Trinity, uh, Trinity being the place that it is. Um, I have, you know, 18 Democrats uh, and one Republican, and then maybe one person who doesn't know what his political co- convictions are yet, who could maybe tilt a little bit Republican. And w- one of the things that I feel is to teach in any environment, you you shouldn't have much of an orthodoxy from the professor. You you want really a climate where I mean, people are going to know what the professor thinks. If you talk about stuff day after day after day, people are going to know what you think. But what you want is an environment where people feel really, really comfortable with whatever their views are. Now, because of the weird odds at Trinity, at least that I get at Trinity, I spend a lot of time propping up (laughs) that one Republican and making sure that he or she has the courage and doesn't feel as though he or she is going to be torn apart uh, by the rest of the class. Um, But I, I do think it's important that everybody feel comfortable and as though their ideas are at least initially legitimate and worthy of debate. And Jim's right. Without the entire context of this, I don't really know exactly what this guy was doing, but it, it does – that concerns me a little bit. Yeah, I would say that most of my students are like the, the one guy that you said was in your class or the one person who doesn't really know what their political views are but kind of vaguely leans Republican. I think there's a greater percentage of, of those in my classes. And I used to be really careful all the time when I first started teaching never to say anything political about my views because of the – I believe the idea that, you know, somehow you're going to corrupt the minds of the young generation if you, if, you, if you try to sway them one way or the other. But as I've been talk, teaching for, for much longer than that, um, I've become more and more um, willing to talk about my own political views because I think th- the students are not as uh, malleable as we might think. I mean, they hear different views from all kinds of different professors, and you know, if it so, if it's appropriate, I tend to be more comfortable. At the uh, while at the same time, I try absolutely to to create an atmosphere. And I always say, I love it when people disagree with me. If you want to disagree with me, great. Let's talk about it. You know, and it's hard. I find it's hard to get students a lot of times for, to 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 come out and take a stand because they're worried about offending people yeah. or, you know, et cetera. And that that maybe is a bigger problem than that, taking I, a stand. I, I totally agree with that. I mean, I think that's the heart of the issue is really teaching people to be critical thinkers and to be willing to defend their viewpoint and willing to have an argument with the professor as an equal intellectually. Because after all, the relationship in in, in a classroom can very easily devolve to somebody talking the subject to death and that. The students should sit there and absorb it. But much more interesting is if there's actual discussion going on and a realization that the person who is ostensibly the leader of the discussion, the professor teaching the class, is somebody who has a viewpoint on the world, who's read things that maybe the students haven't, and therefore that they can have a discussion about this. And so you might then bring out some fairly radical views. You might actually bring out some things that other people haven't heard. And so you then actually have a real discussion that is not just a teaching experience, it's actually a discussion experience. And there, I think, you're bound to have toes stepped on sometimes, and you're bound to have some pretty uh, out there views, for instance, views that students might have that are not based on fact, or they're not based on something that they've learned through reading or something like that. It's just a feeling they have. Well, there's a discussion you can have for a start, and, and that can be pretty painful for somebody who thought that they knew something. And then they learn from other people that they didn't. Hmm. Yes. I think the fact that the professor felt like he had to apologize is 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 um, unfortunate. You know that he was sort of you know maybe in a way bullied but into feeling like yeah. there was something wrong with him expressing that view, and he he had to apologize. I mean. I, I, you know. Well, this he is an adjunct professor, so this is a yeah. little bit like the Jodes knocking over a peach basket, you know, <laughs> that they'd filled. I mean, adjunct <laughs> professors live a very imperiled existence. Um, I, I have been one, and uh, uh, I've had a few controversies back when I was in the classroom, enough so that I felt like I don't want to be in the classroom anymore. Um, I, I don't think this... Were there really controversies in your classroom? Well, it was really more over a, a dress code. And there was a... <laughs> there was a, there was a, there was a per, per, you know, we're teaching practical skills yeah. that require you to bend over and plug in a patch bay or yeah. roll a wire or something. And there was um, a period of time when uh, uh, both men and women were dressing in such a fashion that it would not be practical for them to bend over and plug in a patch bay <laughs> without the rest of the class... 
observing a lot of their anatomy. And so I asked one of these uh, people to leave, and she said she would report me to the dean. I said, please do, and then come back dressed for the job. Uh, that was my big controversy. But I actually gave my students the day off to vote. Did you have to subsequently uh, apologize to the entire, no, I did not. To the entire muffin <laughs> no, I, community? No, in fact, <laughs> the rest of the class cheered. Uh, so, you know, no, the, the whole muffin thing just was, <laughs> it's not really, it, it's a distraction for right. everybody. So, uh, um, a- anyways, I, I think the second professor is a little more controversial than, than this guy, the, the Eastern guy. The guy at UConn was really jacked up and, and seemed like maybe he had, was, had met Walter White or something prior to that and got let, some let, blue let, meth. Right. Well, let me set this stage a little bit. First of all, we could play audio of each of these, and I'll tell you why we're not playing audio of each of these. In the case of the Eastern professor, the audio is just very muddy. I mean, I, I think it would be very hard yeah. for people to understand it. In the case of the Yukon professor, it's A, very muddy, and he use, relies very, very heavily on a barnyard waste product, a waste product of the kind of cattle ranching uh, done by Cl- Clive and Bundy, actually. Um, so and he says left that on the on the lands of our government, <laughs> left on public lands uh, run by the Land Management Bureau. So um, to play this thing, I mean, basically, he just yells he yells that a lot, and he, he, and so I'll just try to set this up a little bit. Uh, this is all involved uh, an itinerant preacher, a guy actually named Carnes, who um, who does travel around the country and. He, uh, doing sort of public declamations uh, of a religiously conservative nature. Um, he kind of specializes on, in getting on people's nerves. Uh, he has – I was able to just in researching him a little bit find two situations where he's been arrested in public spaces for various versions of creating a nuisance. Um, so it was a little surprising probably even to him that when he got to Yukon and he was standing there holding his sign which said evolution is a lie, uh, this professor apparently uh, – he has subsequently claimed he was outraged by things that were going on. Uh, and things that the, this uh, this evangelist were, was saying, he really got in the guy's face. And he, in, in the video, you can watch it very easily on YouTube. It's all over the place right now. He's got his fist balled up. Uh, he's uh, he's about two inches away from the face of, of the evangelist. He's yelling about Darwin. He's yelling about lies. He's yelling about all kinds of things. Uh, at one point, he does do a kind of shove. He takes his fist and shoves against the guy's sign, pushing the guy backwards a little bit. Um, in baseball with umpires, you don't do this. Uh, and and then uh, then somebody kind of shows up and I think kind of maybe separates him from that guy. And then he's later seen much more appropriately and kind of comically doing his own scientifically based preaching uh, about all this. Uh, so we've got some interesting calls coming up here too and I don't want to lose those. But anyway, so that's that guy. His name is James Boster. He's a professor of anthropology. W- what did you want to say? Just You just thought – I just Too much thought caffeine? He, that was the one that, that – well, I, I thought he might have been a little bit – you know, his message was correct, but, you know, sometimes you lose your message if you're uh, – he became the evangelical. He became the preacher, and uh, and he did sort of invade the guy's personal space uh, a tad uh, and got all up on him, yo. Actually, we have an eyewitness here, and he's, <clears throat> I believe it's one of our former interns. He's joining us right now from stores. It's Jules. Hi, Jules. Hi, Colin. How are you? Oh, it is Jules. Good. It's one of our former interns. Yeah, so you saw this? I did. I saw it. I was sitting in the back of class in American Lit, and there's a big window, and it leads onto the courtyard, and I looked behind me, uh, not paying attention. Were you taping the class? No, (laughs) I was not. But uh, I just wanted to say that these guys come very frequently, and people, it's always a big kerfuffle. People scream at these guys, and there's always, people always say that they're, uh, they're, they come and rile people up on purpose to get hit and then they'll sue the person that's sort of like the myth that goes around so this these kinds of uh uh preachers who come and and say things that get people mad to get a reaction are it's like once a week this happens at uconn it's very strange um wow. gotta make a living right you know as a veteran of of, of uh some fairly noisy demonstrations about the vietnam war and other things many years ago I can say that those sort of confrontations were pretty common on campus, that uh, on various campuses. And <clears throat> I think, actually, that's a good thing that these things would be happening on campus. I can't see that, you know, personal assault, if that had happened, obviously would be wrong. And I think that, that you know, you can't uh, defend that. But certainly, 
some of these people who come onto campus, the, the sort of the, the modern equivalent of the flat earth society, you know, now it's creationism and they're coming on and they're accosting people and inviting comment back and they get comment back and it sometimes gets noisy. But that's not a bad thing. To me, that's sort of it, that's a kind of benign confrontation that campuses could do with having more often. I think, I, I think it's funny, um, Jules's point that, you know, it happens all the time and it's almost yeah. like they don't even have an identity. It's just like, oh, yeah, it's just one of those guys. Right. But, so in a way, this it was it, he was really flattering the guy by, by taking him seriously and, sure. and responding to and him. That, and that anger that uh, or that confrontational thing that you're talking about now, James, that used to exist and when people would take to the streets and do something can now be found on Twitter, which is a much more easy way to vent your things and then go back to binge-watching yeah, and, and that, television. And that has a kind of evanescence to it, that it's all swept away within seconds. Right. You internet. just get mad. And you so say, you, you call mad. somebody a jerk, right. and then you've done your and, social and duty. It's, and it's over. But there's something more visceral about in-person things. I mean, it's kind of like, you know, you send an email to the person criticizing what they said, but if you actually meet the person and confront them with their ideas and you talk to them and maybe have a shouting match about it, that has a visceral quality that we're missing in all of that electronic exchange. That was the only thing I, I took away from the Occupy movement that was good is that it was physical. Yeah. Beyond yeah, that, absolutely. it seemed pretty useless. But but yeah. it was a physical commitment to being in a place to right. voice, in their case, really nothing. I do think this puts you got in a difficult position, partly because earlier this year uh, they had an assistant football coach who said wanted all the players to know that Jesus was always in the huddle. And the uh, administration was very uncomfortable with this. This man subsequently stepped down, not explicitly because of this, but it seemed as though there was some kind of connection. At this time, the president, Susan Herbst, issued a statement saying that you know everybody's positions and philosophies need to be respected, but that uh, also members of the administration, people who work for the college, can't be – pushing for a particular uh, spiritual philosophy or religion. Um, and, and this seems as though he's, he's not doing that, but he's... He's not in a classroom. Though, I right? think that's different. I think that yeah. in, the, in yeah. that context, he's acting as an officer of the university and that therefore he has different rules to work by. I think a professor engaging in what is essentially a difference of opinion, a loud one to be sure... But uh, but expressing a different opinion is entirely different from having a group of football players who are locked in a room essentially and being told that okay we we have Jesus in here with us. That's that's an expression of the university that is inappropriate. I think I think that's entirely different. Well, and he was advocating for science, right? I mean, that's not a religion, so that's why I don't see the the connection. Is there really a parallel? Although, if you're shouting down somebody else's religion, it seems to me that you you are effectively making a, a religious argument. I don't. I don't I don't see that you should. That you should. I I would agree with Colin. I mean, I think I think you can't say that um, that a football coach who you know who says that Jesus is in the huddle is too aggressively advancing the the, his own religious philosophy, and then allow a professor in an act of what is really clearly bullying. I mean, there there really isn't too much of a way to get away from that. His his behavior is bullying behavior. It is laced with this particular profanity, which is shouted two or three inches from the face of the guy that he he's talking to. This is somebody who is attempting not to impose his own belief system on somebody because that's not going to work. But to, to really kind of intimidate somebody else for, uh, uh, and discourage that person from having his own point of view. I, the other quickly, this is sort of a little amusing irony uh, about this. I did a little research on this professor, Mr. Uh, professor Boster. His specialty, one of his specialties is in people, people indigenous peoples with who have very strong skills some people would call this superstitious re- belief systems. He uh, studies the Shuar people, who are indigenous people of Peru, who are the head shrinkers. They, are, they were, at least before this was discouraged, uh, head hunters and head shrinkers who would shrink the heads of their enemies in order to have the souls become part of the Sigmund the Freud was what? Yeah, yeah, not that kind yeah. of head shrinker, no. different kind of head shrinker. And, and who believe in all kinds of things like invisible darts that are hidden in the, the phlegm of a shaman and, and all this kind of stuff. And I, I assume he's not down there in the rainforest you know, bumping chests with these indigenous people going, do you know that what you believe is a lie? Uh, but, you know, it, it really, guy. It, all this stuff is, is about amplification, isn't it? I mean, it's so if that had, had uh, it, it was particularly offensive because it took place out in the open. Really, that's a normal conversation at the Cheesecake that, Factory mm-hmm. be, be, because we're, we live in this world that has become a giant Cheesecake Factory where everybody's screaming to get their 
the point cheesecake. heard in the louder. Do people scream at the cheesecake factory? You just can't hear anything. <laughs> you, you could be a foot away from. So you could be a, a foot away from a person. So are they, are and, they and having not, religious arguments? Well, I I wouldn't know because you have to scream so loud to talk to the person you're with that, that you can't communicate. And the louder everyone screams, the more difficult it becomes to hear. And, but I and just think there's – I think screaming for what you believe in is a valuable thing. But you not know? knuckling I mean, up, pressing okay, so up maybe on the guy. The, the, maybe going you – know, touching the person and pushing him is going over the edge. But I don't know what the other guy was doing either. I mean it's not as though the other guy was just innocently – wasn't the other guy trying to impose his beliefs on the whole college? He was, he was, and he was so, loving it. Yeah, I'm sure he loved it. Oh, well, yeah, I'm sure, yeah I, because I'm, he never got that much attention, right? People usually just walk right by. I think he had the protection of a sandwich board also. There's an important other factor, which is this is a public space. This is a place for discourse. This is a public university. That's a public space where the man who was demonstrating, who was telling people a story about creationism, he was there because it's a public space. And if you're in a public space, you can expect reactions. But I even mean, in a public space, you would, have, you would have some sort of personal space well, in there, personal right? Well, personal space. And that's but, what I think the issue came but I, So it's more a ma- matter of manners than it is so of message. So if he hadn't touched him? If he had just yelled without touching him physically ever, would it, you would have been completely... Sure, sure. So just that's that one exactly moment. what James is talking about. Yeah. Oh, I think the bump crosses the line. I actually, I, I'm still not okay even yeah, if, you take, if you really take the bump out of He was really in the guy's this. face. I mean, he could have done it from a foot away and still made his message quite clear. And I question, I mean, it seemed to me, Irene, at a certain point, that you're suggesting that um, that that an anti-religious, totally scientific bent should enjoy an intellectual privilege that's higher than a spiritual philosophy. In other words, that it would be okay for President Herbst to say, you know, we, you can't be advocating your spiritual philosophy, your religion here, but but you can in the same tone of voice, discourage people from having a religious philosophy or explanation Uh, for reality? Yeah, isn't that what our country stands for? For what? Separation of church and state. You know, we have, we, you know, there's a, there's a difference between spiritual issues and... But but this is also, but that, 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 what what that guy is doing is much closer to a violation of the First Amendment. In other words, we don't have separation of church and state. We have a First Amendment that says Congress shall establish no religion. So... And we've interpreted that that to mean non-interference by entities of the government with other people's religion. Well, what that guy is doing there, and he's a public employee, is interfering with somebody's religious expression. So if there's – I don't think there's any First Amendment issue at all here. But if there is a First Amendment issue, I would say the burden rests – uh, on on the guy who's a government employee trying to shut up somebody who's expressing his religious beliefs. I don't. I think it's a question. That, uh, I don't. I see the question differently. I don't think he was trying to shut him up. He's having an argument and with very strong views and telling him his views are, st- are stupid and asinine and therefore he, you know, you should you you can expect an argument about this. Whereas the football players shut in a room being told that Jesus is in the huddle. That's entirely different because the implication there is that the structure of the university, the actual office of the university, is condoning that. In the case of a professor out in a public space in the university property, that's something where he is expressing his personal views about it and is not being perceived, as far as I could see watching that, he was not being perceived as somehow officially sanctioned. The university allowed, if you like, but it's a public space, so they have the right to do that. This 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 man came on to make his demonstration, and I think that that invites comment, even loud and unpleasant comment. I mean, I've been again, I've been veterans of uh, a veteran of demonstrations where I've been vilified, been called names when we were demonstrating early in the gay rights movement. And people did that. You didn't sort of – I don't recall anybody at the time going on saying, well, you couldn't say that word or you couldn't do that. But we would come back with a bigger demonstration and then engage the, uh, engage the people who were doing this in the public space, a public comment. You know, uh, I, this wonder really, if this, I wonder if this was – I'm sorry to interrupt. If, okay. this was, uh, if this was in a language that nobody could understand and we were just going to watch this interaction – how we would feel. I think you would look at this professor and say, this guy is sort of the aggressor. And he does repeatedly invade the personal space of the evangelical dude. So if you had no idea what they're saying, not defending the message, so take the message out of it, but the delivery of the message, then he probably was offensive, I think. I mean, if somebody did that with me, 
If these were two mountain back gorillas, we would understand. They'd be meeting trying to establish. Tegan and Sarah <laughs> right. right here. We, we, uh, we really do have to take a little break here. This is a really good conversation. On, uh, often on the nose, we agree too much, so I'm glad that we don't agree. We'll come back. We'll either continue this because we've got a lot of calls, or we'll move on to Clive and Bundy, about whom we probably do agree. I can't keep it to myself. Yeah, I can't keep it to myself. All right, we're back. It's the nose. Um, and people always people sometimes complain that we all agree too much on the nose. Well, not today, so this is good. All right, okay, we just lost one call. I'm going to try to clean up two calls on this before we move on to Clive and Bundy. Here's Brad in Barkhampstead. I think some of Brad's thoughts go back to our original, our earlier conversation about the professor at Eastern uh, who was um, attacking the GOP in his comments. Go ahead, Brad. They do. Thank you very much for uh, taking my call. Sure. Um, I, I do agree that, you know, uh, the healthy debate in the classroom is absolutely essential for the learning process. Um, you know, and I think you'll, I think a lot of your guests will, will probably agree that part of the learning process is getting students to ask the right questions so that they can find their own answers, so that they can find the truth in whether it is literature or, you know, the scientific process or, or mat- mathematics even. Um, to that extent, I'm guessing all of you have heard the uh, the tape of, of that professor at that time, and, and and the tone of his conversation, I think, was beyond confrontational. I, I think it was almost intimidatory uh, in that anyone after that, after what he had said there, would probably be very reticent about asking a question or engaging that professor in debate. I think, in effect, he squashed debate. In, in the tone and manner in which he delivered his statements. It wasn't... It of wasn't course, yeah, we, of, I, I agree with what you're saying, Although we, and thank you for your call, Brad. Although, we, with lacking the whole context, we don't know. I mean, there really is the possibility. One thing that I've done in some of my classes when there's only one Republican, as I'll say to the, whoever that is, a couple of times over the course of the semester, Michael, you're the most important person in this classroom. You really, I mean, you absolutely are, you're crucial to our, us being able to explore this issue. You can't stop saying what you believe. And, and, and maybe he did that. Maybe that guy did that. Maybe he did. Yeah. But also, maybe there wasn't necessarily, I mean, you know, if, if what, not every single thing has to be debated on the on both sides, you know, because mm-hmm. what he said was kind of true. The Republicans, you know, do want to sort of limit voting rights of certain demographics. I, I mean, think if we had a Republican on the panel, they, you know, they would probably they, push back a little bit on that. Uh, well, okay. It would be, it would be right, hard but, to do, though. I'd have to, I'd have to agree with Irene. Um, it's a tough case to make. And I mean, one of the things they might say is some Republicans want to do that. Uh, all right, let's all go right. to Tom in Southern. Hi, Colin. Uh, hello. Yeah, you're on the air. Okay, um, I I just tend to agree with you, and I think with the previous caller a little bit. I think that uh, Irene and the others on your panel are well educated, uh, intelligent Americans who probably went through a great uh, a great educational system, and are comfortable with the idea that education involves give and take and a certain amount of argument. But I teach in a community college, and I just want people to be aware that many of our students in the higher education system these days are raised in a much more passive way. And and I think that they are used to being bullied and pushed around, and that sometimes, unfortunately, faculty get get, uh, complicit with that and sort of take that on. And I think that that's a perspective that maybe folks who've been to high-level private universities and colleges don't always appreciate about the current state of uh, education in America. Great point, Tom. We're going to end there, just move on to, although there may be connections that we can make, to Clive and Bundy. Most people, I think, now know who Clive and Bundy is. He is a rancher. Uh, he is a rancher who has been grazing his cattle on public lands, and he has been refusing for 20 years to pay the fees. Uh, he got into a standoff with the government people this week. Uh, it, it, it did involve... You know, uh, people wep- wearing wearing weapons on both sides. Uh, at least one person, I think one of his sons, was tased at one point. And for a while, anyway, Cliven Bundy was kind of a emerging on conservative television as a kind of hero, a guy who was standing up against an oppressive government, uh, uh, not letting the the federal government push him around, and maybe sort of a throwback to a kind of heroic Western figure of the past. And then it all came unraveled. But before we get to the unraveling, um, it might be interesting to sort of explore why that is, you know, why somebody like that. I'm sure, James, you have some theories about why, say, Sean Hannity would latch on to a guy like Cliven Bundy. 
Well, I think it's something that, that uh, you know, there's this sort of alternate universe that's possible to create in the land of the Internet and, 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 and uh, television news, the voracious appetite, appetite it has. And they're always looking for a, for a hook. And this especially, uh, I think, sloppy, a sloppy intellectual approach allows you to pick up a hook, pick up a, a, a subject or pick up an incident like this and then mold it to what you think it should mean. And it, in, in the stupidity of it, of course, is not seeing the background and not seeing this guy coming and, and having a sense. I mean, I, I think that just hearing some of his first words, you'd have a sense that, that this was going to be trouble. But I think that there's such a drive to gain, gain audience. It's about gaining the public. It, it's, it's about being their first kind of thing, creating the whole atmosphere and sort of writing the story before anybody else gets any other idea. And you end up, it, you can very easily risk losing it all. And also the idea that the little man standing up against the government. Totally. I mean, that's, yeah. you know, that's what they thrive on. So right. that in itself, yeah. Right, but uh, my, my, one, of the, one of the things that I thought was really astounding about this whole thing as it progressed, I happened to catch a p particular sequence where they were showing the gun-toting friends of his or the, 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 the people who were supposedly protecting him roaming the hills in Nevada. And I really, for a brief moment, I thought, is this Slavyansk in e eastern Ukraine? You know, is this like uh, it, what's going on there? And this is all about image. I mean, that's one of the reasons why the Russians have been so successful in this is in this effort in eastern ukraine is the, the the mastery of the image and creating telling the narrative and that's what a lot of people have done with clive and bundy and of course he crashed and burned very quickly uh, and and when you think of how he crashed and burned a sort of serendipitous thing you know well let me tell you sort of thing he starts talking and all of a sudden this whole construct falls apart i mean it's a perfect textbook example of falling into that trap before we get to that trap, though, I just want to sort of piggyback on something that Irene uh, said and say, don't, does, don't we all like little guys standing up against the establishment? I mean, some of us like the Occupy movement standing up against the establishment. Some of us like anti-war press protesters or gay rights protesters standing up against the establishment. Um, yeah, we want it to be our person. Yeah. I, I, if it's right, our person yeah. standing up yeah. against the right, establishment. Right. Yeah. Uh, and you, I, you know, I, I will say uh, two things. First of all, I, I anticipated that Within a week, there would be a country single called The Ballad of Clive and Bundy. <laughs> so I started writing one yesterday. <laughs> and, uh, and, and, of course, it immediately stopped. And, uh, and last night, Stephen Colbert did one. Ah, and, uh, that's and right. He that was stole great. my thunder. And, Masterpiece. Um, and, and secondly, I would say that there's a, you could trace a, a thread to, to the gravity that these kind of figures throw. Because he's not a guy with a lot of gravitas. But he is perfect – for kids who want to grow up and play guns. And probably when you and I played guns, we had definitive bad guys. It's post-World War II that, you know, we're going to get the Germans. And uh, the generation after us probably fought the, the pretend fought the, Jap the, the Viet Cong and, and, and uh, Muslims were next. And now we're the bad guys. The government has in this new narrative that they've created, the actual federal government is the bad guys, and they're, the kids have real guns. And people who believe in science. And so the, you're idiots. Who, so you're yeah. a feat, uh, intellectual idiots. That's the, all. So the big kids it. now make the little kids be the Bureau of Land Management. The big kids get, get to be the cowboys. So uh, the, it did unravel. It did uh, uh, all the marketing possibilities. That I mean, one thing you learned this week, I think, is write your ballot much faster. We live in right. It's right. 2014. Yeah, yeah you got to have that. You can't be Woody Guthrie about this. You got to. Yeah. Uh, but uh, it all did come unraveling, uh, unraveled because once the camera was trained on Clive and Bundy, he just started talking about everything. Thing he thought, and some of his thoughts were unpalatable. I think we can hear a little bit of that right here. I want to tell you one more thing I know about the Negro. When I when I go went uh, go through Las Vegas, North Las Vegas, <clears throat> and I would see these little government houses, and in front of that government house, the the door was usually open, and the the, the older people and the kid. And there's always at least a half a dozen people sitting on the porch. They didn't have nothing to do. They didn't have nothing for their kids to do. They didn't have nothing for their young girls to do. And because they were basically on government subsidy, and so now what do they do? They abort their, their young children. They put their young men in jail. 
because they never they never learned how to pick cotton. And I've often wondered, oh, are they better off as slaves picking cotton, having family life and doing things, or are they better off under government subsidy? Uh oh. Um, I, I would better family life yeah. than that slave life, right. really. And I, you know, I would say that Clive and Bundy. One of his problems is that the last movie he watched about slavery was Gone with the Wind. Except in Gone with the Wind, the sin committed by Gone with the Wind is that the slaves are depicted sitting on the porch enjoying right. lemonade and things like that. Whereas, in fact, in real life slavery, they worked you know eighteen, twenty hours a day and were completely separated from their family at auction. Usually, uh, it's. I mean, I don't have to sit here and conduct a class on everything that was wrong with slavery, but you know. You were sort of saying that you could start the kitchen timer for when there was going to be um, a, a ballad of Clive and Bundy. I, I don't know about you, anybody else here, but I, I was watching him. I thought I could start the kitchen timer before he says something. Yeah, uh, right, yes. right, right, right. But on the other hand, there are a lot of people, I think, who would still, even with this um, you know, horrendous statement that he just made, agree and be on his side. You know, I mean, I think we shouldn't forget that either. He, Dana Loesch He said did sort he, of flame out with certain people, with mainstream people. But what what did you say? I, I, this is a really short interjection. Jan, Dana Loesch, who's a conservative sort of uh, wonky person, said he just needs more media training. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's all. He just needs I, to sculpt I, his I, point of view. You can't argue of, with that statement. Well, yeah. yeah but right, I would right. say that the, you know, the white supremacist <laughs> uh, impulse is not insignificant. Right. No, and so, no, I mean, so there, so there are people, you know, for whom he didn't flame out by saying that. No, but and James, I don't know what you're about to say, but it did strike me that this is at, we are at a moment where the Republican Party really is starting to understand the degree to which they're on the wrong side of demographics. It, so, to whatever extent thing. this guy was attractive to say a Rand Paul, he can't be attractive to a Rand Paul anymore. Well, and on that theme, exactly true. And in terms of media savvy, I don't think it was anything to do with media savvy, but I can't think of a more succinct statement that could be made that had all of those buzzwords in it. Every single one of them was sort of like a reminder of all the things they don't want to talk about. And it was like almost like, was this guy a plant or something? But no, he's just like spouting this stuff off. But it was a real lesson in media and how things turn out rather than being manipulated. And I think that now, you know, you've got a situation where you it, people have embraced him because of the words he used, I don't think they can run away from it because these are words that are direct, you know, talking about slavery, picking cotton. I mean, this is no, there's no euphemisms in there. This is really direct, a slap in the face. But it is a lot of the Tea Party philosophy, isn't exactly. it? Exactly. Well, yeah. well, that's I what I mean. They can't the escape tea, it. The, the, you know, the Tea Party embraced his original philosophy. The Tea Party does not uh, advocate a return to slavery or suggest – I mean, I don't, I don't know anything in the, in the Tea Party's rhetoric that would line itself up with what we just heard that guy say. Except well, there is – the only thing is that he does provide a nucleus around which a bunch of really weird out there – um, with guns, you, with the guns of a can community. coalesce and get together. I mean, I, did you ever see so many people in camouflage and right. guns? It was a party for them. The only thing different from eastern Ukraine was that they didn't have balaclava masks on their faces. Right. Maybe they made a mistake and on that one. There are a lot of racists in the in the Tea Party. Don't you have to admit that? Th- there certainly are racists in the Tea Party, but I, I, I am un- uncomfortable saying that the Tea Party movement itself is universally yeah, I don't think it is. I racist. Mean, I mean, right, and they, I mean, I mean, I know Rand Paul can't can't you know uh, uh, support him, but some of his supporters do have that philosophy, and I think that's that's being stirred up also. And this highlights it. I think yeah. that that's exactly the point: is it highlights those people, not the entire Tea Party, but it in- highlights those people who do indeed believe that, and they actually it, operate. It, that and way. it energizes them too. We have to wrap up here. Just we'll have time for endorsements. We'll go away, and then we'll come back. Ted Bundy, Al Bundy, Clive and Bundy. I'm sure there's some really nice Bundys out there, but the last name is getting to be a red flag. Today's show was produced by Betsy Kaplan and me. Our interns are Skylar Magnoli and Jane Ashley. 
Greg Hill appeared in our intro and tweets for us at WNPR Colin. Katie Talarski is our executive producer. The part of Bill Curry was played by Jonathan Winters. For show pages, articles, and a picture of the Faith Middleton Show staff rounding up snails at their Wild West escargot ranch, visit WNPR.org. On Monday, the scramble takes a hard-boiled look at the weekend news. And now... Back to Colin. David Daly, who the editor of Salon.com, will be joining me as a guest analyst on The Scramble on Monday. All right, time for endorsements. We'll start with James Hanley. Um, very quickly, uh, I just wanted to remind people about Thomas Piketty, who's written Capitalism in the 21st Century. I keep on pressing that. It's an incredible book, an incredible revelation. You were about, an early adopter, and yeah, now yeah, it's like, you, it's you like everywhere. It's sold oh. out everywhere right yeah, now. It's yeah. absolutely amazing book. Um, the other thing is we have two great free film festivals next week, the Real Youth Hartford Film Festival at SUNY Studio on Wednesday evening. And on Saturday evening, we have the Trinity Film Festival, uh, which is also free admission. And we have refreshments starting at 6 o'clock. And there are people coming from all over the country entering films. And uh, it's a great event. So uh, Film Festival Week is coming up. Pika D is, gets two op-ed. I think Krugman and Brooks both had op-eds about him today. That's right. He's he on yeah. fire. He's on fire. But you were, you were a very early adopter here. You heard about it here <laughs> first on the nose. <laughs> right, right. All right, Mr. Chapter. Okay, uh, I have a couple of things. Uh, there's an album coming out called Here Comes the Rain, R-E-I-G-N, which is a revisitation of the British invasion of the 80s. Uh, Chris Collingwood, myself, the Shinolas, uh, did a track called... Uh, uh, I can't forget the name of the song. I've spent so many hours on it. <laughs> <laughs> is, it a, is it a cover? Uh, or is it uh, a... It's a cover by Dream Academy. Okay. Um, uh, so, and then uh, Shinolans are playing the Green River Festival this year up in Greenfield, and uh, Nora Jones will be there, and Trombone Shorty, and, it's a, and we'll be bringing Freddie Johnston and Chris Collingwood and Sid Straw, so we're, we'll be doing our review. And we're also opening the Sunken Garden Poetry Fest. Wow. We're reaching out to Walt Whitman and uh, Wallace Stevens right now, although we haven't heard back. Yeah. That's <laughs> <a session point>. July <laughs> 11th. No, right. June 11th for June the Sunken 11th. Gardens. Nice. Um, okay, well, I have one, my first one has to be arguing without bullying, you know, and just an answer to that caller. I completely agree with you that bullying in the classroom is horrible, but arguing, teaching and trying to teach people to argue in a in a in a good way is really important. Um, and um, uh, but also I want to endorse desk blotters. I mean, I'm all I've always you know, I tried to switch my calendar to my phone. I tried to keep it in a little book. I have trouble with my calendar, but now I have this desk blotter on my desk. It's really giant, big calendar that sits on the desktop, and it's such a good way to keep track of events. I just can't. I just can't say it enough. I, I do think the desk blotter does give you kind of a sense of the the, the global time yeah. you're dealing with. I. I I like them, too. All right. I've got a few. Um, the, the one I really want to endorse is uh, something called Here's Li- Here Lies Love, which is a musical by David Byrne. It's playing right now at the Public Theater in New York. It's about Imelda Marcos. Uh, it's also the kind of musical, and I've been to a few of these recently at the kind of theater, where uh, the audience stands and sometimes is instructed to do things. Sometimes they give you a, a Filipino dance craze step that you have to do. Uh, and, and, and you are moved around, too. The stage is constantly being switched around, these rolling platforms with ingenious interlocked to create new shapes for the actors to run around on. Uh, and so you're out in the audience hopping around and hopping out of the way of these platforms and dancing and this pretty interesting. It's, it's not perfect. It's got some musical problems. The music's a little bit monochromatic, but it's really kind of fun. And the night that I was there, uh, one of the people hopping around in the audience and occasionally taking notes was David Byrne, which is kind of exciting to be hopping around with David Byrne. What could wow. be better than that? A um, uh, novel by Nathaniel Rich called Odds Against Tomorrow, uh, which is about uh, a, a quantif- quantitative analyst, a Wall Street quantitative analyst who specializes in worrying and fretting about potential disasters. And then he's in New York City when a disaster closely resembling Hurricane Sandy, but a lot worse hits. But it's a comic novel, but it also brings up a whole, and it's a immaculately researched novel about all the things that can go wrong, because this guy is a real phobic, obsessive person about all the things that can go wrong. Last quick endorsement. Um, I don't necessarily, I, I'm exactly with critic Emily Nussbaum of The New Yorker about this. Uh, the series Orphan Black, as in terms of plot, in terms of execution, 
you know, it's, it's maybe a B minus or a B. The performance by Tatiana Maslany, this uh, Canadian actress who plays, I think, eight different clones, all with completely different manners of speaking, uh, fashion sensibilities, all very, very distinct personalities. Uh, occasionally she'll play one of the clones imitating another of the clones, uh, and, and, or even one of the clones imitating another of the clones imitating another of the clones, and, and just holds the whole, whole thing together in a magnificent way. This actress, she is absolutely worth the trip to the series Orphan Black, even if the plot doesn't make any sense to you. I know, right? See, if I had enough money to buy a house with like a really big yard, I would totally get a German Shepherd. I grew up with one. His name was Alex, and he was so smart and loyal. Hey, are you recording me? You're recording me. Stop. Don't turn that thing off.